For every actor that made the trip to Hollywood, became a star, there are dozens, if not thousands, of stories of actors who didn't find the fame, didn't achieve the success. Their stories ended in tragedy. That's why they call it the Boulevard of Broken Dreams. We're going to be sharing some stories out of La La Land, Tinseltown, of some of the more famous stories of uh, unsolved mysteries and crimes um, that have fascinated me. Uh, I'm a big Hollywood guy, as as you guys know, and uh, I'm fascinated with the history of the town and all the success and the glitter and glamour and all that stuff. But I'm also obsessed with the seedy side of things, the dark side of Hollywood. Um, I can't get enough of that stuff. I have the books at home and read the stories and the Wikipedia articles and, and that sort of stuff. Um, Nick, are you, uh, well, let's have you introduce yourself to the audience. I'm Joe Johnson, uh, Hollywood buff. Uh, Nick, introduce yourself. Tell us about yourself. Yeah. I'm Nick Amati and uh, I'm a partner in Imaginals Workshop. Uh, basically we do a lot of writing and TV and, uh, scripts and creative concepts and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, I, I'm here because I happened to stumble upon a fascinating conversation between Joe and Andrew over here. And I too share a, uh, a passion for mystery, crime, you know, uh, murder mysteries and all that kind of stuff. And Hollywood is rife with them. And when I, when I stumbled upon the conversation, I said, you know what? This is utterly fascinating. Joe's the reservoir of, so much cool stuff. <laughs> I'm trying to keep this PG, and I will do my best because, you know, we want this to be family-friendly just by talking about murder. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. right. We want the family to gather around and <laughs> gather learn around about everyone. these stories. Uh, Andrew, you're no stranger here at Owen TV. You've uh, been doing a podcast for a while. Uh, tell the folks at home about yourself. Yep. Uh, Andrew Walker uh, started off doing uh, Pristine Peninsula. It's a comedy tourism podcast about michigan and uh i'm a fictional host and i just go around the state talk it fictionally talking to people and i have fellow comedians and improvisers on and family members and on tv workers and anybody (laughs) i can just pull off the street uh just to come on and do it just do a character for 45 minutes and just lose lose themselves and just have fun and be in the moment and and just start with a topic and go there now it's called Pristine America because I ran out of uh, <laughs> local. <laughs> yeah, I, I ran out of Michigan-based topics. Some, so you know, today America, America, tomorrow the world. So, <laughs> there you yeah. go. I like to describe ONTV where we're recording this podcast uh, as the Hollywood of Oakland County. We yeah, yeah. we get people who come from all over, uh, hoping to achieve some level of fame here at ONTV by creating their own shows or podcasts. Um, I know I've been recognized at, you know, the bank or the grocery store, which is also always a lot of fun when someone uh, recognizes you. So, um, I, so yeah, we're a little slice of Hollywood right here in Oakland County. What I, what I can tell you for sure is that uh, on TV is the Hollywood of zip, uh, yeah, zip code 48360. So that is, that is <laughs> a fact. That Definitely. is on its Wikipedia page right now. That's right. An That's oasis right. of creativity. I love yes. it. <laughs> so, yeah, like I said, you know, I've been fascinated with these stories for a long time. I have books at home. Uh, one of them is called The Hollywood Book of Death. And it's <laughs> not all uh, unsolved mysteries and, and you know, sordid stories, but uh, there are lots of unusual deaths and maybe not so unusual deaths. Some of them are just interesting, you know, like uh lou costello who was uh, hospitalized with uh, i think he had a heart attack or something like that and he was in the hospital and he seemed to be recovering and he i think his agent or something was visiting with him and he said you know i could really go for a, a cherry cherry soda i think he described it so his manager went and got him a cherry soda came back gave it to him he drank it down enjoyed it and he said that's the best darn cherry soda i ever had and died Wow. I died after finishing off his cherry soda. At least that's the story that's out there. Uh, I've never heard that. What's no. the What's the the phrase? Uh, if the truth is boring, print the legend or something like that. So a lot of these stories might be rooted in legend more than fact. Sure. Um, but it's always fascinating and interesting. Oh yeah. 
a lot of movies that we see, you know, that are supposed uh, biographies or bi- biopics, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, a lot of that is based on the legend and not so much the actual facts. Right. Even though a lot of times the actual facts are, I think, are more interesting than, than the legend. But mm-hmm. yeah, that's Hollywood. You know, yeah. they're trying to sell a ticket. Um, so yeah, you know, there's so many famous stories, uh, out of Hollywood, um, going back to the early days of the silent films, uh, Fatty Arbuckle was one of the very first scandals, uh, in Hollywood that, uh, had everyone else in the country calling Hollywood, you know, a cesspool of degenerates and that sort of thing. (laughs) And there was a whole sequence of, of these sort of things that happened in the early days that, um, brought about the creation of the Hayes Code to try and tone down some of the content of the early movies. It's it's kind of interesting when you go back and you watch uh, some of those early, what they call pre-code movies. Wow, they were getting risque early on, and yeah. uh, they cracked down on them pretty quickly. So er, like, the early days of Hollywood. Back was, in the 20s? Oh, yeah. yeah. I've nev- I never knew that. Yeah, the It Girl, Clara Bow. Holy cow. <laughs> I watched some of her early films, and I was like, wow, I'm in love. I wonder what she's doing. And it. how do you spell uh, her last name? B-O-W, Clara okay. Bow. Thank you. That's yeah. that's not for me. That's just for everybody else out there listening. No, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. this would be a lot easier to get away with if we weren't on camera. But Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of the stories we're going to share, you know, murder mysteries and stuff, but there's also that sordid side of Hollywood where there were rumors about Clara Bow uh, taking on the, I think it was the UCLA football team. And rumor was uh, one of them was John Wayne. Um, so there's <laughs> lots of stories like that too. Now what's true? I don't know, but it, it's fun to read about. <laughs> so you talk about the original era of disinformation. Yeah, exactly. You know, you, you had those rags, the, the head of hoppers and, and you know, those, the smut peddlers back then who, man, if you got on the wrong side, they would drag you through the mud in their columns and there was nothing you can do about it. And there were a lot of victims of these petty, vindictive right. journalists, if you can call them that, from those early days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, even uh, Lucille Ball, um, she she was watching, maybe she was listening to a radio program and uh, I forget the, the famous journalist's name at the time who had the radio program, but... He said, you know, what What famous redhead uh, votes red? And she's like, ooh, I wonder who it is. And it turned oh. out it was her. And she's like, what do you mean? And and turned out when she was young and went to register to vote, her grandfather was a registered communist, and he had encouraged her to register as a communist. So she did, and she didn't practice communism. She had just registered, and someone right. dug through the garbage cans and found out that she had registered as a communist, and they broke the story, and she had to she had to fight to save her reputation and convince them. Perfect that. example of what happened with uh, James Gunn on his, his Twitter feed. Yeah, I was, I he was used to have some to pretty... Pretty gross, uh, you know, raunchy uh, jokes on Twitter. Um, and, and he admits to it, and he apologizes. He's like, yeah, I was out of line. I was immature. I was trying to be, trying to get, you know, my name out there by being absurd. Um, but there was, a, what, a good year or so where Disney, like, was yeah. hand, was hands off. And wow. he, he completely quit social media and everything. But he did the right thing. He gave it some time. He wrote a heartfelt letter. Every single person who has ever worked with them, has said vouch for him yeah every unless have you heard any, anyone say not anything that bad i have about him? i've that, never heard anyone say anything bad about him that's uh, the danger that's just, of uh, social media yeah. is i'm i'm shocked when a story breaks and someone digs up a tweet that was posted in 2011 right. and it's like where did you find that where do you get that that that's all out there and and twitter, there's an industry for that twitter is not really real life context either you know you could you, you, sometimes you see people put uh, two different tweets up next to, of the same guy next to each other, but they're saying completely contradictory things. But you yeah. look at the day, and it's like two years difference. Yeah, right. It's a, it's an yeah. out of con- a lot of stuff happens out of context because you could have someone post eighteen straight things on Twitter, and if you take number fourteen by itself, it might sound horrible. <laughs> yeah, right. When you don't add the... the, the, the yeah, it's stream, Twitter is stream of conscience. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've seen incidents where someone would quote something somebody said to condemn it, 
and then someone just shares the quote yes. and says, this person posted this. And it's like, no, 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 I was quoting somebody else. I, I hope I hope uh, in, at all levels of school, uh, our schools are teaching uh, social media literacy like, right. hard, exactly. hard. Yeah, but who's teaching to... it? <laughs> right. Right. It's, right. It, it goes back to what Joe was saying. Who, who taught some of these journalists journalism? Sure, sure. Right, yeah, no, no, but at least if they cover the topic. Yeah. The, yeah. The subject, yeah. that's at least a, a good step. There are classes. Uh, a friend of mine who got me into video production what, during her high school uh, tenure, she she taught media literacy. So let's hope schools are still doing that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one of the stories I wanted to share today, and um, maybe a lot of people out there are familiar with this, maybe not. Um, something I read a long time ago, and it, I just found it so fascinating with its twists and turns and i've always said if, if i had any clout in hollywood this would be sort of my signature are these these golden age of hollywood uh murder mysteries unsolved crime sort of thing i just find them so fascinating it was a different era back then and and the cover-ups and and yeah. disposing of evidence and all sorts of stuff. And the movie studios were involved in that a lot. Uh, oftentimes, before the cops were called in, the movie studio heads were called in to clean up a crime scene, and then uh, then they'd bring the cops in. Like, and... like with Clark Gable? <laughs> yeah. What happened with Clark Gable? Didn't he, he kill somebody uh, drunk driving? And I did not know that. Wow. I'm going to have to yeah. look that up. Or was it Errol Flynn? <laughs> well, Errol Flynn had another yeah. story. Yeah. The, 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 it was um, one of the two. Okay. Errol Flynn, who uh, now we don't want them suing us. <laughs> no, of course, of course. But no, Errol Flynn uh, was accused of statutory rape and with some teenagers, and it was pretty much agreed that a rival studio had set him up. And he oh. went to court, and the teenagers testified against him, and he was acquitted, and then that gave birth to the phrase "in like Flynn." Um, where he was so <laughs> charming and so likable yeah. that he, he dodged the charges, was acquitted, and everyone said, oh, well, he's done in Hollywood, and then his next movie made a fortune. <laughs> so he was untouchable. Errol Flynn was untouchable, and I've been meaning to get his book, uh, My Wicked, Wicked Ways is the name of his book, and I really yeah. need to read that because he's had a really interesting you, uh, you know, career. You, you both touched on something very important because for those for the studios that – popped up around that time it got really game of thrones like they are they mm -hmm. carved out territory which oh, actors yeah. would work with them on what kind of contracts and if you oh, wanted yeah. them out of the contracts you had to give us yeah there was horse trading almost yeah, like how they do with sports right now trading it's, players it, it's I, I think it's one of the it's the birthing pains of of a, a of a new medium or a new industry right you right, know right, and right. it starts out hard and rigid and people literally you know get killed over it and when and here's a full disclosure on this one Joe is is about to mention a case, and it is utterly fascinating. And like I said, I knew next, to, I knew absolutely nothing, maybe one percent or point one percent. I think Andrew and I were talking about this. Joe just said, "Go take a look at it," <laughs> and I don't think I saw sunlight for about two days. It's so easy to do, definitely. So the, back in, during the silent film era. There was a guy named William Desmond Taylor, born in 1872, if you can believe it. Um, he acted in 27 silent films and then became a director and directed 59 silent films between 1914 and 1922. Um, interestingly, they found out a little bit later that uh, this was his second life. Um, he left a wife and daughter behind in Manhattan and started a new life, new career in Hollywood. Uh, so he wasn't exactly squeaky clean either. But um, on the morning of February 2nd, 1922, uh, William Desmond Taylor's body was found inside his bungalow um, at the Alvarado Court Apartments in Westlake, uh, L.A. Uh, a crowd gathered. You know, the, the crime scene was not secured. Yeah. A crowd gathered. A doctor uh, went leaned down and examined the body and said that he basically died of natural causes. And they said the doctor kind of vanished from the scene and was never seen again. So who was this guy? Um, so they took him at his word and said, well, I guess he died of natural causes. And then as investigators arrived on the scene and they rolled over Taylor's body, they find a bullet hole in his back. So unless you consider natural causes lead poisoning, um, he was <laughs> shot in the back. And they were like, oh, I guess he didn't die of uh, natural causes. 
So now they had this crime they had to investigate. Um, and so the weapon was not at the crime scene, so the, the weapon was never found. Uh, eventually he was buried at the Hollywood forever cemetery in a mausoleum there. And if you've never been to the Hollywood forever cemetery, it's an amazing place. Um, it's part of, uh, the Paramount studios property. Um, and so you can visit Paramount studios and go to Hollywood forever after there. And, and, uh, there's all kinds of legends buried at this cemetery, including Rudolph Valentino and people like that. So that's where he is today. Um, but I digress. Uh, when he, when his body was found, he still had all his possessions on him, uh, uh, jewelry and money in his wallet and all kinds of stuff. So he wasn't robbed. This wasn't a robbery, which raises red flags. Like, okay, right. this was deliberate. Now, one interesting thing is that, um, his accountant said that Taylor had shown him a large sum of cash that was on the premises a couple of days earlier, and that cash was not accounted for. So at some point, someone walked off with Taylor's cash. Now, was that related to the murder, or did someone take advantage of an opportunity after the fact? I don't know, but a large sum of money went missing. Um, So as investigators uh, investigated the scene, uh, they deduced that he was killed the previous evening around 8 o'clock at night. Now, there was a witness, uh, neighbor Faith Cole McLean, uh, heard a loud bang around 8 o'clock the previous night, uh, went out to see what was going on. She thought maybe it was a backfire or something like that. She says she saw somebody leaving the bungalow, and it was very odd. She said it basically looked like a woman dressed as a man. It was like an ill-fitting jacket, hat pulled down. And she said from a distance, the, the supposed accused killer turned and flashed a smile at her as they left the bungalow, which is so creepy to think about. Like, yeah, very. That's yeah. so bizarre that, that the killer went and, like, pulled up the collar and tried to leave, that they would smile as they were leaving. That's really odd. Um, so there are several suspects. Um, Taylor's valet, Butler, basically, uh, was Henry Peavy, an African-American who found the body. Uh, There was some talk about him being suspected, but I don't think that ever came uh, to anything. Now, he replaced a previous valet, and his name, the previous valet, his name was Edward F. Sands. I'll check out this guy's rap sheet. Prior convictions for embezzlement, forgery, uh, desertion from the U.S. military, um, had several aliases, spoke with a fake Cockney accent for some reason. Um, He had worked as Taylor's valet and cook until seven months before the murder. Um, When Taylor went to Europe um, the summer before 1921, Sands had forged his name on checks, wrecked his car. Um, (laughs) Later, Sands had uh, burglarized Taylor's bungalow, leaving footprints on the bed. Um, after the murder, he was never seen or heard from again. Now, what? that's a pretty likely suspect, but probably not the stuff movies are made of. Um, so we need to look at some of the other suspects here. Um, Hollywood starlet Mabel Norman, who was a silent screen star, of course, was the last person to see Taylor alive. Um, Taylor was madly in love with her, um, and he had helped her try to battle her cocaine addiction. Now, an interesting twist to this story is that Taylor was so angry about the people that were supplying his love with these drugs that he was going to rat them out and identify them to the authorities. So imagine that getting back to the guys who are supplying this Mabel Norman with drugs finding out that Taylor was about ready to identify him. And some with clout, no less. Yeah, yeah. So um, so Mabel was uh, interrogated, ruled out as a suspect, um, but uh, they said she was inconsolable at the funeral and uh, just was out of control. Um, now, this is where the story gets interesting. This is my favorite part of the story. Um, Taylor was sort of a mentor to a, act, a former child star actress, Mary Miles Minter. I love that name. Uh, she was his protege. 
Uh, he, she acted in uh, numerous Taylor movies that he directed. Um, and when they searched the bungalow, they found numerous love letters from Mary Miles Minter um, that she had written to Taylor. Uh, now, keep in mind, at the time of his death, uh, Taylor was 49 years old. Mary was 19 years old. Yeah. Um, but she professed her love, and Taylor, believe it or not, rebuffed her. He was not interested, and he was quoted as saying, she's too young for me. So oh, that's, so he wasn't a... It's kind of noble, don't was, you yeah. think? He wasn't a complete Woody Allen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, so, now, interestingly... Uh, again, as they were searching the bungalow, they did find a silk nightgown uh, in his closet with the initials M.M. on it. So, interesting. How did that yeah. get there? I don't know. Now, here's what I feel is the most likely suspect. Her name is Charlotte Shelby, who is Mary's mother. da 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 And she was described as a typical stage mother. Um, and when she was questioned by police, the police said that her answers were evasive and full of lies about Mary's relationship with Taylor and all sorts of stuff. Now, here's where things get really interesting. Apparently, she owned a rare 38 caliber pistol with unusual bullets, they say, which were similar to the ones that killed Taylor. <laughs> I mean... And when it, the story broke in the press that uh, she had this similar gun, guess what? She threw the pistol into the Louisiana, Louisiana Bayou. Huh. That's not something an innocent person would do. And you do not want to go anywhere in the southern half of Louisiana. <laughs> I'm surprised that she made it out of L.A., yeah. To go all the way back well, to Louisiana. She, she escaped that, yeah. the media circus that was going on at the time, and she, she got was lucky. the prime suspect. Joey, I also like to point out that how you just kept saying, oh, this is the most interesting part. <laughs> After you it gets more the- and more interesting. Now, um, in addition to Mary, uh, Charlotte had another daughter, Margaret, who publicly accused her mother of the murder of... William Desmond Taylor. So her own daughter was convinced that her mother had done it. Um, For some reason, the police chose not to pursue it for reasons I don't understand. And after a number of years, pretty much all evidence, I, I just read this today, all evidence pretty much had disappeared except for some notes that had surfaced in 2007, I think it was. Um, but, Anyone who wanted to investigate the murder today wouldn't have any evidence to work with. It was all, it all vanished, was destroyed. I had read comments like uh, the police were encouraged to drop the whole case. Um, very fascinating, very interesting. And that would be one of the problems with trying to turn this into a movie is how do you resolve it? You know, do you, do you make the accus- accusation as the, the filmmaker or do you just play out the facts as they were presented and let the audience uh, come to their conclusion? Uh, Nick, after hearing these facts and, and doing your own research, what's your conclusion? What, if you were investigating this case, what would uh, what would you present? First of all, I'd like to fire the doctor who said that it would die if of he natural was cause. Even a doctor. If he was even a doctor, <laughs> I, I, I think there there were so many things about this when you pointed out that. After Taylor was shot, everybody and their mom was able to walk onto the crime scene, yeah, enter they the trampled place. the crime scene, yeah. So there was, you know, if you talk about fingerprints, you'd be fingerprinting the entire block or the entire entire apartment complex. I mean, yeah. there's just so that that goes out the window. Uh, the police letting, not even looking for his former uh, uh, chauffeur. Yeah, the that guy, he just vanished and never was seen again. With his history, and first of all, Taylor, no background check on anything, but geez. And, you know. Well, the, here's, here's since we're on that yeah. subject, there's a theory that this former valet was Taylor's own brother, oh. who Whoa. Taylor had hired, I assume, out of pity, even though he probably knew that he was a low life, good for nothing, hired him as his valet and butler, and may, it, well, it was, a, it was a prime suspect. And you know what? That that also that's another you were talking about how the guy was uh, writing checks when he went to Europe mm-hmm. and and just basically there was something about before Taylor's death he was getting letters and one of them said that they had they they because he was robbed 
you were you were right about that. that mm-hmm. And some of that stuff was pawned, and on the pawn slip was something like Daniel Tanner. It was a name that they thought was Taylor's name when he abandoned that family yeah. on the East Coast. And so you're going oh, the the set of brass balls on someone <laughs> to rob you, pawn off that stuff, and then sign the pawn slip and then give deliver it to you to say I did this to you. Yeah. I don't want you to know it, and I know who you are. So I mean, you gotta wonder what what did he have over William Desmond Taylor? But uh, the police found none of this interesting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they just, I mean, yeah. You, I, I'm still, I'm, I'm not even really here in the studio right now. There's, <laughs> I'm still down that rabbit hole, <laughs> trying to find my way out because there. Yeah. When I kept going down this, I was like, okay, so did nobody want to find out what was going on here? I mean, Andrew, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think it was one of those things where just a, a, the right amount of people that were at the right level of society, of elite society, were involved and in, were like, you know, a couple good old boys sitting in a room just kind of nodding and it being understood. Mm-hmm. That's what it seems like. Because e- each each way you turn here, there there's pretty much a dead end. And uh, I was looking up uh, information of... Um, Margaret Gibson, who you you were talking about, and I I don't know if you mentioned this, but when she when she died, uh, she did confess to murdering Gibson. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So she died in '64, reportedly confessed to murdering Taylor. Wow. Okay. So, huh? Interesting. Now, Joe, you asked me if I was doing this. Who would I? What what lane would I pick? I I know everything's pointing. And she she confessed, but I I would probably start off with I would start off with the valet, uh, the, who's maybe you know with a fake Cockney accent who might have been his brother, because my from what I can see I think that was the person that was threatening him, and you talk about money that was missing even though a lot of jewelry and stuff it wasn't an obvious robbery there was something yeah. going on here, you know just real quick you know who the yeah. guy reminds me of by his 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 little bio. Um, is uh, the guy who who did the movie The Room, Tommy Wiseau? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if you read a little bi- biography, it sounds just like uh, this dude, <laughs> the valet, the valet. Oh uh, my god, Edward Sands. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, keep going. I no, just thought that was pretty funny. I, I I think this would be a fantastic limited series. I could really see this on. Oh somebody. yeah. And I would, I would take all I, I would take all the facts, and the audience might make their own conclusion but if i was picking a path i would go after sans i i would pick sans because that's where because you know taylor rebuffed uh mary minter yeah you know so i mean i don't know what the mom was complaining was like lady i don't want to have a relationship with your daughter i'm not trying to be uh you know i'm not trying to rob the cradle here well i think the mom wanted to ride those coattails and and what? actually was pushing for the relationship you would think she would have been opposed to the relationship. She was actually pushing for it. I think she wanted to benefit from it. And yeah. her and her daughter, they were estranged for a while because they were always right. arguing over money and stuff like that. Um, and so I think when the mom found out that Taylor wasn't interested, I, I don't know. I get maybe she confronted him and things got ugly. I don't know. It could. It could be simple. You know, she. You know. You, you, how dare you try not, not, not fall into my bad press <laughs> to skyrocket our, our family's uh, name in there. But yeah, uh, yeah. but the fact that she, if she did do it, if she did actually shoot him, she left LA and got back to Louisiana to dispose yeah. of the weapon. Did no one, I mean, and here's another twist to, to kind of point fingers at the mom is that apparently she had exhibited similar behavior in the past where she had threatened people. I think it might have been another director at gunpoint. Now, one article that I had read said she had actually shot another director, um, but she had that uh, that repeating pattern of right. behavior where she would threaten people at gunpoint. So, who knows? Maybe maybe she was went there to threaten him. He laughed it off, turned his back, and maybe it went off, and she was like, oh, what just happened? I don't know, but she may have gone there to to threaten him, and things, uh, as uh, Ron Burgundy would say, things escalated quickly. <laughs> yeah. so. Now, Nick, would if you were to do a series like you were talking, would you do uh, a dramatization or a documentary? Oh, I, I would do a dramatization. 
Okay. It, it because not not because I want to take creative uh, license with a lot of the stuff, but because it does give you a little bit more. Because look, with all the different theories on here, you need to have a little bit of wiggle room. I'm not saying like we're gonna yeah. have aliens or we're not gonna say it's like the president order it or nothing like that. But you know, there's definitely you have. There's so many ways you can explore this, and yeah. you could take the audience on a ride and wh- whatever stop they want to get off at. It's like no, I'm staying with Minter. <laughs> you go for Sands. You know. I think the fun way of telling this story are the reveals. Like yes. as you reveal more details, it becomes more interesting. Now there was a movie that came out years ago. Um, uh, it was called Hollywood Land. Ben Affleck played George Reeves, who was Superman on yeah. television. And the official story is that he had committed suicide, even though people dispute that, say it was unlikely. The interesting approach that the movie took is they showed multiple ways that it could have gone down. Now, I'm not entirely sure I'm, I'm happy with that because I, I want to see a movie make a statement and say, this is what we think happened. Right. And I thought it was sort of a easy way out to say, oh, it may have happened this way, it may have happened this way, you decide. So I don't know if that's the approach I would take with this particular story is you, you play all the facts and then let the audience decide, or do you say this person did it or that person did it? So I don't know. Here, here's what I would do if I had a eight-part series. I would go Tarantino on it. <laughs> I would, like in Glorious Bastards and uh, Once Upon a Time, where – at first, I would make make you think every single person could be a suspect. Yeah, and and you know, like uh, knives out, knives, knives out, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, death, death on is it Death on the Nile? Uh, yeah. Murder on the Orient Express. All the, yeah, yeah, yeah. all that. that a good, that a good who done it? Right. Yeah, or like the Thin Man series. You ever watch the Thin Man series of movies? I, I've I've heard of it. Oh, but, with William no. Powell and Myrna Loy. It's the same same concept where so many different people are the suspect. And and uh, the the uh, William Powell character, uh, they uh, Nick Charles and and Nora Charles, they get everybody in one room, and then he presents the clues until the killer gives themselves away. Okay, I was gonna, I, I'm starting with with the uh, the different characters, but I'm going the opposite way. They're they're all very loosely connected. They're not in a, in the same room or in the same scene trying to figure things out. Yeah. And then I, when I bring in the um, the fictional part of it, the historical fiction part of it, that will be the reason. In 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 this world, that will be the reason why that person died. Like, uh, it, what he died in what, nineteen twenty two. So, uh, who, whoever was president, you know, <laughs> accidentally like ran him over with his car. <laughs> but of course, it would, I would do something more serious, yeah, yeah. slightly more serious, but. I, a big cover I, up. I would tie it all in, and uh, I wouldn't do anything uh, decisive and say this person killed it, um, or killed this person. But yeah. um, I would, I would definitely screw around the edges with it. See, what I, I, I have my final shot all set in my head. So you know, as it gets investigated and you reveal all the suspects and their sordid backstories and the mom's history and all that stuff, and then it's revealed that the the, that she had owned the, a, a weapon that was similar to the murder weapon. I, the last shot, I think, would be seeing the mom standing on a bridge and the audience is like, why is she standing on that bridge? And she reaches into her little you know, pocket bag, pulls out the weapon, tosses it into the river, and no murder weapon, no charges, credits roll. And so you can you can imply that she did it without overtly saying that she did it right but in my opinion like i said the the valet is a convenient suspect but it's not the it's not the most romantic yeah 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 so i would imply that the mom was behind it end with her disposing of the supposed murder weapon credits roll another angle that i would also try to take is why was nothing done about it because this wasn't look I, i hate to play the classism role here but this wasn't some bus boy at a at a restaurant. Yeah, this was one of the biggest Hollywood directors at the time. You know, the, the man had a lot of clout, hence why it was a, a, a big scandal, and nothing came of it. I think what they were trying to do initially, because they they were afraid of the rest of the world 
uh, judging Hollywood and, and the debauchery that was going on. I think they tried to sweep things under the rug, which just made things right. worse. And they said that at the time, this story was in every pulp fiction magazine and everything in the country, and people were eating it up. So it kind of backfired. And for every bit of evidence that was swept under a rug, that just led to speculation and everything. So I think they tried to suppress it. Maybe it was the movie studio heads, whatever, but it blew up in their face and became a major story. And this, keep in mind, this happened just months after the Fatty Arbuckle scandal where he was accused of killing a woman that he was having relations with. Right. He was proven uh, not guilty, but his career was over. And so that was like in September, and then this murder happened in February. So it was right on the heels of that. So I think they were really trying hard to suppress everything, and it and it, it just became more and more intriguing for, you know, the mid Midwest farmer, you know, reading the magazines, trying to eat up every bit of that. Yeah. Speaking of which, speaking of Fatty Arbuckle, I saw his car today. His what? personal car is on display in Chesterfield, Michigan, at the the Stiles Automotive Museum. There, okay. to my surprise, the the woman, the general manager there, said, "This is Fatty Arbuckle's car." And I said, "Well, <laughs> incidentally, we're going to be mentioning him tonight." So. Nice, nice. Yeah. So enough about this case. Um, well, let's move on to the next case. Nick, you're you're bringing something to the table today. Let's talk about uh, a story that that uh, intrigued you. Yeah, I, I I'm going to cheat and use my my phone notes here but, <laughs> but yeah i when when we were doing when you when you mentioned this case about taylor and then you gave some okay look into these other areas and then one of the names that popped up there outside of fatty arbuckle was the case of thelma todd now thelma todd she was born in lawrence massachusetts in around 1906 and the thing is she'd always wanted to be a school teacher but she was very easy on the eyes, as I can say back then. I mean, I may still say it now. But <laughs> um, she ended up winning a beauty contest, and that put her on the map uh, for Paramount Pictures. And so what happened was she got noticed. She went through, I guess, actor school, which they take you from you know Massachusetts to New York because Par- you know Paramount's headquarters was there at the time. And they said, okay, you're ready. We're sending you to Hollywood. And she went over there. And initially she was, you know, in sound films. But then once the talkies started to come about, they realized, hey, you know, she can she has a voice, you know, so she can actually uh, act and and hold her own. And she was comedy was where she made it was one of the genres that she made her marks and she acted with the Marx Brothers. Yeah. And and to survive that transition from silence to talkies there, you know, if you ever watch the movie Singing in the Rain, there they they had that one actress with the high squeaky voice. There were yeah. other uh, actors who whose careers were over when they yeah. switched over to talkie. So they have that gift of being having that presence of transitioning to the to the talkies was huge. And the rumor was that there's a lady that's going to be mentioned. She was a silent, um, silent movie star, who ends up in the Thelma Todd uh, mystery here. And I think one of the reasons why she didn't continue to be a star was because like you said once they said oh my god that's what she sounds like <laughs> okay well that's nice you're you're in the background now uh her name was jewel crane and she was the wife or alleged wife which you talk about twists and turns of ronald west who was the director who in 1931 did a movie with um, thelma todd and said oh wow and of course blonde starlet attractive and uh, you got a, a one of the better directors at the time, Ronald Weston, who had a lot of clout in Hollywood, and of course they had a relationship, and they were in love, and they had this <laughs> this very uneasy relationship. But the thing was, she'd made her name, she was big in Hollywood. Nineteen thirty one, I think, was her peak, and then nothing came of the relationship with Ronald Weston because he was allegedly married to Jewel Crane. And then what happened was, she ended up marrying this. Uh, Italian man, uh, De Chico, and this guy. You talk about not doing a background check. <laughs> I mean, this guy. You know, they they said that you know he came from a family of you know uh, the the broccoli, the 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 what's the what's the word the the broccoli kingdom like the the empire. That, <laughs> what, that that, Italian... what the heck is the broccoli kingdom? So basically, you're talking it, the vegetable, or you're talking? Oh no, the, the, uh... yeah, the vegetable. So basically, <laughs> oh, I thought you were talking. About <laughs> no, no, no. Something. When I was listening to this, so, 
Yeah, so it has to be out broccoli like king like, of Los Angeles. Probably like Central Valley, California, right? Oh, no, no, like this is in the East Coast. Yeah, oh, yeah. really? Yeah. But, but he was from money is what you're Yeah, he's, he, yeah. Okay. his family came because they were like, okay, so I guess the Italian mob is going to get involved in broccoli now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, why not? And he, Wasn't so he, that a, a sub-story on The Godfather? I know. It might have been. <laughs> so he makes his way out, out, out west. He ends up meeting her, and they get married in 1932. By 1934, they're divorced. Thelma Todd and De, uh, DeChico are divorced because she's citing, oh, he's drunk, he's abusive, and she's filing for divorce, which, again, back in the time, I hate to say it, you know, when, when people got divorced, you, you, Joe, you were talking about that, oh, Hollywood's a moral uh, you know, cesspool. Yeah, oh, yeah. my God, is marriage not sacred? What is going on there? Well, yeah. you know, a woman getting divorced, you know, we knew we shouldn't have given them the right to vote. <laughs> this is what you know, it's like it was a slippery slope. <laughs> and, right. and that kind of stuff. So you're like, oh, wow. So she divorced him, and he had all sorts of mob connections. At least that's what they, they alleged mob connections, what they were saying. Mm-hmm. The interesting thing about this De Chico guy, after the whole Thelma Todd is, you know, she's found dead, I think, in 1935, in December 16, 1935. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that real quick. De Chico, after all this, ends up marrying Gloria Vanderbilt. Yeah, Vanderbilt. That Vanderbilt. Wow. And he Anderson Cooper's mom. He's he's like in his <laughs> mid thirties. Isn't that isn't that I don't know. And That's she's sixteen. She's sixteen when oh, she gets married. Man. Hold on. Yeah. Look up it is uh, uh, That's wild. when I was doing the Thelma Todd thing, they said, Oh, and what happened to DeChico? He ended up, you know, getting remarried and he ended up married, believe it or not, to Gloria Vanderbilt. I'm like, What? <sighs> Gloria Vanderbilt? She's 16. She didn't want to get married. He's in his 30s. They got married. Wow. And, of course, that ended in divorce because citing violence and alcohol. So mm. so a- Anderson Cooper's parents are Gloria Vanderbilt and Wyatt Emery Cooper. Right. Yeah. Wow. I did not know that. <laughs> See, folks, you listen to this podcast, <laughs> you learn all kinds of interesting stuff. And, and, and uh, I think I read somewhere uh, Anderson Cooper, like, interned in, in – uh, grad school for the cia so huh. so i mean there's definitely they're definitely an embedded uh family oh, i mean the vanderbilt empire wow. yeah i mean there 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 are stories about them too but with thelma todd what happened was so on, on december 16 1935 she was found after she attended a party at uh, one of her um her her actor friends had this um a party at a trocardo or something it was a nice restaurant and she was there. She ended up going home around three o'clock in the mornings when her chauffeur was driving her. Anyway, they, uh, her maid, goes to the house owned by Ronald West and Jewel Crane, uh, and they find her in the garage, in the car, slumped over uh, her own car, and they said that she died of accidental suicide which Mm -hmm. is a very weird way to phrase it but it's carbon monoxide poisoning right the thing was she ended up living in this so Thelma Todd and Ronald West and his wife alleged wife Jewel I keep saying alleged wife because they said that oh they never really were married but they kept saying they were (laughs) so they were having an affair uh, Thelma Todd and uh, Ronald West while he's allegedly married in what was one of the weirdest things I've ever seen, she ends up starting a restaurant with them. Yep. The at, Sidewalk Cafe. Yeah, the Sidewalk Cafe. And she got this, they did this right after the Great the Great Depression, right, right when the crash hit. So where did you get the revenue to do this? Yeah. But they did it, and they built an apartment above the restaurant mm-hmm. where Thelma Todd lived in one, one of the spaces, and then the space right next to it, separated by one wall, is Ronald West and his wife. Mm-hmm. So they're all living together. Wow. And then 500 yards away, a little bit up on the hill, Ronald West and his wife build a mansion. Mm. So it's about 500 yards. You have to go up like a, little, a, small, a small you know, staircase up this hill, and then there's a, there's a little bridge. So Thelma Todd was known at the time in 1931. Like I said, her popularity was really high. She had made a lot of actor friends. She was known for having been you know, very free with her sexuality. I mean, mm-hmm. if men can do it, why can't she? You know, mm-hmm. and so she didn't, and she didn't care. So she was very outspoken. She was 
I, I ended up, when I started reading more about it, I said, wow, this would be a nice lady to hang out with. It's like, she's fun. Like, she's just. Yeah. She's not. She enjoyed be, life. Exactly. Yeah. She, she, and she's not the type that would be like, you know, I'm going to kowtow to everybody. I'm, I'm not going to be the meek little person. She And she was anything but that. So Ronald West tells her on the day of this party when she's going to be home by 2 o'clock in the morning. And she kind of jokes, according to witnesses, I'll be there at 2.05. So it gets to about 3 some three o'clock. She's not home. Ronald West gets up and wants to walk the dog. He walks the dog. He says, oh, she's not back. I, I checked in the room. I saw the ruffled bed sheets. She's not back. I guess nothing really happened. So I went for a walk. I came back home. And I thought I heard the door rattle. And I thought... Oh, maybe she can't get in. I opened the door and she wasn't there. So his his story didn't make a lot of sense because in the past she'd been late before. So Ron was always concerned, saying, "Hey, you know, you're a woman. You know, you shouldn't be out late." Whatever cover story he wants to give. Thelma Todd was the type of person where she she would just she didn't care. She's not the type. Oh, would I wake up Ronald? In one instance was it documented, she picked up a rock and threw it through the window to say, let me in and open the door. So if she's willing to do that, she wouldn't just knock like on the door. Tiptoe, yeah. Tiptoe. And so they said, oh, well, it's kind of cold outside. Maybe she went down to the, the garage and she turned on the car for warmth and then didn't open the garage door hmm. and she died of carbon monoxide poisoning. The autopsy showed that her blood saturation level was 75 to 80%. That's a lot of carbon monoxide. Yeah. Because, I mean, carbon monoxide can get into your blood very quickly, and it latches on, and it does not let go. That's why it's it's so deadly. Well, the question here is, did she inhale it while she might have been unconscious? And That's a possibility. There's the thing, because when she left the party, there was an instance where there, there's a, amount, a chunk of time that cannot be accounted for. And the witnesses say that she went to a restaurant and she saw DeChico there. And from witnesses said that they had a pleasant conversation. There was nothing really about it. And then she, she left to go home. One of the autopsies said that she had undig- partially digested peas and carrots in her, which, you know, that's a weird last meal if you're going to do anything like that. Yeah. And it doesn't sound like the party that she went to was big on peas and carrots. <laughs> and for someone that committed suicide, she had no note. She had her trunk of her car was loaded with Christmas presents. Mm. So why did you buy Christmas presents if you and then if you tend to kill yourself? It, yeah. n- none of it makes sense for the standard uh, guidelines which you would expect for someone to commit suicide. She had made she had done a photo shoot. She was excited about the the, the calendar to come out and uh, and or for the for the magazine and everything yeah. like that. So n- none of the signs pointed to suicide. Not all of her friends said she had she gave no signs that she was depressed with her life. When it, yeah. at least to take her life and all that. So now I had read that uh, those who found her body at the scene saw blood and bruises. What did your research turn up? Okay, so there. Uh, what I like about this is there are conflicting theories. There are some people that said, "Oh, she had a broken nose and broken ribs," so that immediately suggested foul play. She was beaten up and left unconscious, and someone murdered her by turning on the car. She breathed it in. Others are saying that, listen, the actual autopsy report, when they and they look at the pictures, her nose isn't broke. You don't see hmm. any signs of physical violence. There was no signs of bruising. Interesting. So, but the, the, then comes the question, do we trust the doctors? I, I, we, we, you have to trust something. You know, if they, you right. can see the pictures online. I mean, they, they, they've put some of the pictures there. And it looks like it's carb. She just kind of like breathed it in. It didn't look like she was battered and bruised and all that kind of stuff. But you could have been drugged, and that's one of the things that they, they're, they're alluding to, that she could have been drugged when she was being brought home by her chauffeur. For some reason, her chauffeur, she asked her chauffeur to drop her off at the uh, about a, a few hundred yards away from the apartment where she was staying. But instead of going to the apartment, she ended up walking up the bridge while drunk all the way to the mansion where the car is parked, where, where she allegedly died, mm-hmm. to wake up Ronald West. And that didn't make any sense. For someone, her shoes that she was wearing are not hiking shoes. She just came from a party. She had the heels on. The heels didn't show any signs of walking up dirt. And, and going, go, or the dress didn't have any marks of being, because it, 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 the weather was not that great, so there was a lot of mud. So how did she get in the car? Yeah. 
Now, did you, uh, when I read about this years ago, there was a mob connection. Now, yes. I don't know if you read this story that, uh, because, I don't know if it was her husband slash boyfriend's mob connections or whatever, but I had read a story that these mob figures wanted to use the restaurant as sort of a money laundering base of operations. Yes. And Thelma being Thelma said, no, I'm not going to let you turn my hard hard earned money, this restaurant that I built in, into this sordid thing. And this bad thing happened to her soon afterward. Right. Did you read that? And what are your, what are your thoughts on that yeah. aspect of the story? And, and this is why I love Joe. Thank you. <laughs> because there, there's, there's so much stuff about this that I, I almost feel like the, the costume is trying to cram. Like there's so much stuff in my head. I'm like, Oh, thank you, Joe. Thank you. Yes, there yeah, was. Yeah. And yes, absolutely. Uh, when it came to a restaurant, which was co-owned by Ronald West, she wanted it to be a, a model business, like no corruption, none, none of the none of the hanky panky yeah. stuff. She even joked the night that she went to the party. She was telling her friends, "If you guys come to my restaurant, I'll give you, I'll comp you." And the day, hmm. the morning of, they showed, or, or her, actually, her friends showed up and said, "Hey, where is she?" She said she'd comp our our bill, you know. And Ron was like, "Oh, I don't know." And that's when they found her hmm. in the garage. And so they were like, oh, this is, you know, this is tragic. But the restaurant was an ideal location, an ideal uh, business to launder money yeah. for the mafia. She didn't want any part of it. They were like, you are going to have to do this. She was a successful uh, Hollywood Hollywood star. Yeah. And she had money problems. In fact, in 1934 and 35, she had, you know, not enough money to pay her taxes. And people said, well, how does this make any sense? How do you not have money to pay taxes? When you're making this kind of money, you know, well, mm-hmm. when you're paying off the mafia, <laughs> if you have to they're pay off the mafia, they're taking their cut. They're taking yeah. their cut. Yeah. You know, uh, this this goes back to what we were talking with Taylor and potential mafia connections and how money was, how cash was just missing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it, what's your conclusion? What do you, do you believe the, uh, the oh, asphyxiation theory or? It, if we're doing a limited series on this, she's murdered. Yeah. There, there's this, when you talk about accidental, because accidental suicide, w- several witnesses and take, you know, witnesses with a grain of salt, they swore that the garage window was open. They said, I swore it was open. It couldn't have been closed. Yeah. So. You know, there's a, there's a movie I just watched recently and I, I, I wish I could recall the title, but there was a similar storyline in that a, a wealthy socialite wanted to get rid of her drunken lout of a husband. So they had a gathering. He got really, really drunk. Everyone sort of left. Uh, somehow he ended up in the car in the garage, and he passed out drunk. So she turned the key, started the car, closed the door, left, and wrote it up, chalked it off as, as uh, he was drunk and started the car and fell asleep. And it's, I wonder if that uh, storyline somehow borrowed heavily from real life, because it sure sounds to me that yeah. she was placed in that car. The door was closed and they said nighty night. That's, that's yeah. the conclusion that I come from. The, the, the concept, the, the suicide isn't flying right now. No, no, not at all. There's it, no reason, no motive there. No. Nothing. There was no, she gave no signs, no indication uh, there was rumors that she was having an affair. Uh, she had a boyfriend in San Francisco, and San Francisco came up a couple uh, came up a couple of times in, in her in her murder machine. I was trying to dig dig through that. I didn't have time. <laughs> I didn't have time because I was going, "What? There's another twist in this." So, yeah. Thank you, uh, Joe, for uh, <laughs> sending. Like I said, when I say I didn't see the sun, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> the sun went up, went down. I was like. When I was looking up Taylor, then I was looking up Todd, and I was going, oh, my God. <laughs> now, coincidentally, sometimes I feel like the universe speaks to me. It's it's really odd. Um, and I have this, like, relationship with L.A. And just days ago, I follow a lot of these uh, Facebook pages about old Hollywood and stuff like that. And on my Facebook feed was a then and now photo photograph of Thelma Todd's Sidewalk Cafe. And apparently it still stands today. 
And I immediately said, next time in L.A., I'm putting that on my to-do list. Is it I, operational? I believe it is oh, operational. Wow. Now, I don't think it, it uses the same name. Under, right. It's under new ownership. But I thought, what are the oh. odds of that as we were planning this podcast that Thelma Todd's Sidewalk Cafe would pop up on my Facebook feed? I'm going to have to look that up. That would be very interesting. They still yeah. have an annual event for her in her hometown of Lawrence, Massachusetts. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah. They wow. just Every year they have it. Because you know, small the small town lady who made it, mm. she if, actually did it. If I were to do a uh, eight part mini series on this story, You're I would stuck on eight for some reason. You can go <laughs> hey. to ten. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm That's a hard mostly, eight. Most Netflix series, I think. Are, yeah, yeah. I hey, I'm a hard eight, and I used to dance. <laughs> I used to dance under that name too. So, um, so I I would focus more on the like the the murder would happen uh, with in the first episode. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sure. And then the 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 story the story would uh, focus on all the collection of evidence, all the theories of why, why, why. But then, um, what they miss, and you find out it's it's the it's the very last second of of the series as she actually did commit suicide, and that there were clues along the way that they missed hmm. that that pe- people watching it in twenty twenty two would see, but. P- but people in 1935, uh, then, it's 1935 yeah. would would have missed it, would have flown yeah. under the radar, and that would be the huge twist. Yeah, for me, you know what? I I, I recently binge watched Columbo, the old TV show Columbo yeah, with love- Peter Falk, yeah. and what was interesting about that series is every episode started off with the murder. You saw who killed the victim. And then the drama, the entertainment, was watching them try to fool Columbo for the next 50 minutes or whatever. And I thought that was a really interesting take on the murder mystery uh, theme was to say, "Here we know who did it. Now let's see if they can get yeah. away with it. The and audience knows the information that the character doesn't. Exactly. And, you just want to see and how it the really does. creates yeah. the drama. Like, well, is Peter Fox Columbo sold that, him? too. I just, because he... Yeah. <laughs> Ah, just... Well, he toyed with him like a cat and a yeah. canary, man. He toyed with the, the murderer and acted like, oh, yeah, maybe you're innocent. And then at the end, bam. So he, so it, it, it always, every episode ended with him getting getting the bad guy? For the most part. Yeah. There are a couple of exceptions. Um, there's There was one really interesting one where he felt sorry for the murderer because – she had murdered a guy in retaliation for, I think, raping or killing her sister or something like that. Right. So she murdered the guy in retaliation, and Columbo let it slide. And I was like, ooh, Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Yeah. It's, uh, it's <laughs> just, well, not just for the, Columbo. I mean, if you haven't seen it, but for the latest, for the remake of um, Murder on the Orient Express oh, okay. with Kenneth Branagh, that, that was what a justifiable murder, is if there is such a thing. Where yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, Hercule Poirot was like, "This is not right." So those are a couple of uh, the Hollywood murder mysteries, uh, unsolved, that are just fascinating to talk about and theorize about. Um, will we ever know the true answer? Probably not. Um, but I really feel like you know Hollywood filmmakers are neglecting this yeah. area of of the. Uh, real life hollywood stories they they tackle them a couple uh, on occasion but i'd like to see more of that um and so we're going to be bringing you all kinds of stories that i've read about and i'm intrigued about and, and i'm sure you two will bring some stories to the table too uh like you know the black dahlia and some of the more famous oh, wow. stories but maybe yeah. some of the more obscure stories as well sure. and they don't necessarily have to be from the golden age there's some Modern stories oh. that are just as interesting, uh, you know, over the past decade or so, too. So um, hope you guys had fun talking about uh, these uh, Hollywood crime scenes. And yes. uh, we'll uh, hopefully see you back uh, real soon. Yes. The, the only thing I'm missing is a little bit of cognac. <laughs> there you go. That's right. I'm going to get my fedora next time. There you go. So, all right. And thank you for listening and tuning into this podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. And we hope to see you back here. Uh, real, real soon. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Thank you.